is about race and ethnicity. And I guess I'm going to concentrate mostly on the race part of that. It's just to make it a little, ethnicity is super complicated too. Um, I think one of the most interesting or coolest things about this class is that we get to do a pretty deep dive into the idea of race and racism uh, to an extent that people in the United States, we need to know this stuff and it's very important to our lives. But a lot of people in the United States have a very shallow conception of the idea of race, where it comes from, how it was formed in interaction throughout the Americas. So throughout Latin America, the Caribbean and North America, that's where we get our modern ideas about that people are grouped into these categories called races. We really get that from the encounter in the Americas. It is certainly true that for all of, all of time, people have been commenting on different types of physical difference. And so some of the ideas about race were brought to the Americas from Europe. But they were sort of greatly expanded upon and truly developed in the Americas where people got much more of a sense of kind of how the, the broad contours of uh, what the racial categories were about. So the first thing I want to talk about is the what we mostly say we measure race upon, which is skin color, and what skin color looked like around the times that people started sailing across the ocean. So around 1492. So we use that year as a kind of base baseline because at this time it's not that people weren't migrating. They were, they were, they were walking and traveling in various ways and sailing in various ways. And obviously the Americas had already been uh, been peopled and populated, and people had been moving around since they became people. But at this time, uh, movement was in some senses slow in that you would travel from place to place. And the earth, these, the populations that were in these places exhibited what we call a clinal skin color distribution, which means it changes gradually as you went would walk from the tropics or the equator uh, up toward the north or walking in the other direction, which is to say that, and you can see here a little bit, you can see the skin color variations, a scale from one to 30, that if you walked from what is now Russia down into through the Middle East and into Africa, what you would find is from place to place, you would find that the skin color tone, the average skin color tone of the inhabitants changed gradually. There would never be a place where you would cross a river or cross a, a, cross a road and all of a sudden you crossed from one skin category from like white to black. It would be a gradual distribution all down the line. And this also applies to what was going on in the Americas, people who lived closer to uh, the more uh, sun-dense areas uh, developed uh, darker skin or, or didn't depigment as much as people who lived in the northern latitudes. And there are a couple of explanations for this. Uh, one of them is the vitamin D absorption, which probably led to a depigmentation across Eurasia, uh, as well as uh, sunlight uh, blocking. So that they, you know, they didn't want to, uh, they they didn't want to, to you, you don't want to have have your skin get burned. But again, uh, it was a gradual uh, distribution in skin color. So if you put somebody uh, from the north up next to somebody from uh, the equatorial region of Africa, 
or, or the uh, sub-Saharan Africa, you'd say, oh yeah, huge physical difference. But if you simply walked along this range, what you would see is a gradual difference that would uh, extend across this geography. And so what happens in the Americas is that under the colonial period, you bring people together across the ocean and you put people together of different skin tones and different origins and you put them next to each other in ways that they may not have been uh, in, uh, in, in prior times. And so uh, this made people think about racial categories and they started to slot people into different ways of thinking that people belong biologically or naturally to certain categories of race. Now, uh, you'll notice that some of the areas of the world in this colonial encounter are basically left out. So although people in the Americas talk about Indians a lot, people really from India are basically left out of the racial classification scheme that develops in the Americas. And so even to this day, uh, people in the United States are kind of confused about what to do with people from outside some of these regions that we've assigned a category to or that we've assigned a place to. So um, this is, uh, this, um, what happens here is, uh, is that we, we, we start assigning racial categories based on a sort of limited sample of the human population uh, that then become the racial categories uh, that develop in the Americas in the last uh, three to 500 years. And so as Santa Bria says on page 126, this modern concept of race, our ideas that we have about race today come from or originate in the colonial encounter. And anthropology has spent a lot of time after that to, uh, to outline to us why race is actually a social construction. That is to say, it's a category that we have made socially and culturally and impose it upon biological variation. So anthropology has spent a lot of its, a lot of its lifetime in some ways fighting against some of the uh, racial categorizations that arose during this colonial period. Now, when anthropology says race is a social construction, which is a very, uh, you might hear it a lot in anthropology, I want to emphasize two things. That whenever you hear race or gender, is a cultural construction or a social construction, there are two caveats that I want to immediately apply. The first is that we are not saying that there are no biological differences in the human population. In fact, anthropologists, as we saw in our last film on the Great Inca Rebellion, spend a lot of time uh, researching biological differences. What we were saying is that those real biological differences which do exist don't group or sort into these things that we call races. So you can't use the real human biological variation to sort people into our three or five racial categories. There's simply too much variation that doesn't concord with those categories. The other caveat I want to say is that when anthropologists say, and we'll talk about this with gender too, when we say gender is a social construction or race is a social construction, that means that it's very real. It doesn't mean that we're just imagining things. It doesn't mean that it's just something we made up. It is something we made up, but that means it is supported by our society and can have a huge effect on your life outcomes how much money you have, what kind of healthcare access you'll have, expectations about who you will be. So when we have a social construction, that means it's a very uh, important thing in our lives and we should pay attention to it. We want to say it's a social construction because it's not given in nature and we might be able to change it over time, but that doesn't make it 
not real. And so we need to pay attention to that. I don't want to spend too much time on this. This is something that we can dive more into. If you take an anthropology class or biological anthropology, you can get a lot of that. We want to really concentrate for our purposes on the Latin American stuff. So I want to first talk about how we typically do race in the United States or how we think we do race in the United States. This, of course, is a picture of Halle Berry, who won the Oscar for Best Actress in a Leading Role in 2002. There she is. Now, this was a big deal. Why was it a big deal? Yes, she is the first African-American woman to win the Oscar for Best Actress in a Leading Role. As of now, she thought that, and a lot of people thought that this was going to be a groundbreaking moment. Uh, I'll just mention that as of now, she is the only woman of African-American descent to, yeah, so it didn't. Uh, actually, I read a, an interview with her recently, and she says, I mean, this is a big deal. And uh, Hallie said, it, the moment, that moment really meant nothing. It meant nothing. And so looking back on it, like it didn't, it didn't change things for uh, black actresses. So how do we know Halle Berry is black? We don't. We don't. <laughs> well, a lot of people would say, well, okay, let me start with another picture. That is Halle Berry's biological mother with whom she was raised, and there they are on the red carpet. Um, so ha obviously Halle Berry's bi biological father uh, is uh, black and identifies, uh, is both phenotypically and identifies as black, but her mother identifies as white. And so I bring this example up to say that in the United States, sometimes we think that we look at people's skin color and we decide their race. But that's not really how we do race in the United States. In the United States, we have some ideas about descent and ideas about what we call blood, but we apply our own cultural rules, our own US American cultural rules to those ideas that we have about descent and blood. So although people say that race in the United States is based on skin color, it actually isn't. And we'll look at examples of places where they do actually talk about people's skin color and try to group people by skin color. In the United States, we don't. So let's talk about the general differences between how race is done in the United States versus Latin America and the Caribbean. And this is making a huge generalization about a whole range of, of countries and places here, but this is kind of how people see it. In the United States, we tend to make rigid distinctions in the sense that you're, you're one thing or another, and that is uh, given to you in rigidity. And as we see with Halle Berry or Barack Obama, or other people of what we might consider, what we consider in the United States to be mixed ancestry. In the United States, our mixtures follow a cultural rule, which anthropologists call hypodescent, which is to say, if you are the offspring of what is of a mixed union, the, the person, you, you get the characteristics of this socially less favorable or less desirable race. So as we saw with Halle Berry, even though her mother is white, since her father is black, she becomes African-American or black. And, you know, this also applied to, and, and still to this day applies to uh, indigenous or Native Americans, if you were the, the product of a union of a white person and an 
Native American or Indian, you would become Indian. And, and so we start measuring people in sort of fractions. Um, in some states, this was codified into law and uh, you know, put a couple more things there. So that, you know, you would measure person's ancestry. So in some states they said, well, if any of your great grandparents, if you were one eighth African descent, then you're considered black. And uh, there were some states that adopted what is called the one drop rule. If you have any African ancestry, then you're considered black. So that this, in the United States, we developed a di dichotomy or a, a line between white and black, which you were either on one side or the other, and it was legally enforced. And that legality or those laws also determined certain things about who you could marry, where you could live, uh, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, status you could have in the world. And that's kind of typical of the United States. In Latin America and the Caribbean, in contrast to the rigid distinctions, race is often said to be more negotiable. And that it's not kind of completely determined at birth. It might be negotiable as we'll see over a lifetime or it can change or in different social circumstances. It seems to be more navigable, you might say. In many Latin American countries, and we'll talk about this and all these things in more detail, but the idea of mixing or race mixtures could lead to children who acquired the characteristics of the favorable uh, race or, or, or descent of the parents. So this is called hyper-descent, where your offspring uh, kind of uh, get, uh, get the, the favorable qualities assigned to them instead of being lowered. They also had typically have many more categories or several different or even lots of categories as opposed to simply white and black. Uh, there are a lot of places in Latin America which did have kind of laws about uh, that would be similar to our laws of segregation, but in practice, these were much more difficult to enforce. They, they just, they simply were, there, there may have been laws on the books, but nobody really knew about them or, or did anything about them. So this is a kind of a general overview of how in the United States and Latin America, uh, it, they have had different ideas about race. Now we're going to delve into the Latin American side since that's what we're doing in here. We'll come back to the United States at the very end. So, uh, different categories for uh, races. So in the Latin American and the Caribbean countries, uh, instead of having sort of a uh, a black-white divide, people believed that there were different kinds of, of middle categories. And uh, some of these come from, there's a series of what are called casta paintings. And as you can see here, this is a four by four grid, which exhibited uh, all the names for the various unions uh, and the offspring of those unions, which they felt they found in the Americans. So that, you know, if you mix uh, a indigenous or an Indian person with a Spaniard, that person would become mestizo or mixed. And if you mixed a black and a Spaniard, that person would become mulatto. And if you mixed an Indian with a black, that person would become zombo or th there were various terms for these categories. But the point is you could have all these intermediate categories that were their own thing. They didn't have to necessarily fall into one side or the other. So that, you know, I mean, if you contrast that with the United States, where you, you would have, you would sort of have to fall on one side or another of that line, 
instead of making up a or, or creating a mixed category. Now, these these are sort of an idealized version of, you know, I mean, obviously people aren't going to come in 16 different categories either, um, but it portrays a, a, a different approach to colonial rule, which was quite concerned with the, the, the sort of uh, race mixing that we see uh, in, these, uh, in these examples. The second, the second sort of broad theme as to why people believe that in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, there is greater fluidity or more negotiability about race is, has to do with the idea of hyper descent. The idea that if the first cross, for example, of a Spaniard and an Indian would result in a mestiza, but if that mestiza then married, or I guess we'll say married, if that mestiza then had a child with a, another, a Spaniard, then that would become uh, a castiza. And if that castiza then married together with a Spaniard, then that child could sort of go up the scale and become a Spaniard or Spanish again. So the idea, instead of sort of always sinking down, you might say, and when I say sinking down, I don't mean, I, I, I don't mean to say that the, 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 the sinking down in the sense of the social value of those categories, not in any sort of absolute sense, but instead of the United States where people would be constantly being shoved into the lower status category, in some instances in Latin America, um, you could kind of rise up uh, over, over time. And uh, Santa Bria talks about this in Cuba, the idea of hyper hypergamy gammy, or marrying someone who is of higher status and that you could thus, uh, thus improve your status by making this marriage. And people spent a lot of time trying to uh, sort of deliberately get this status. And it also was a search for, for whitening to, to acquire uh, a lighter, lighter uh, offspring and that they would, they would achieve this status. Um, Cuba is an interesting example. Actually, Lewis brought up in the comments Cuba uh, today, um, in some ways. Um, Cuba is an interesting example for people who, who, who travel there. Um, but even after, the, uh, even after the Cuban revolution, a lot of people commented that at least the leadership of even the, in the Cuban revolution was pretty light skinned. And that there seemed to be a kind of gradation down from the leadership all the way to the bottom uh, that we, uh, I hope we'll, we'll be able to talk about this later on of colorism, where, you know, it was still very much uh, uh, better to be uh, in Cuban society, even after the revolution, it seemed to be of an advantage to have a lighter skin. Um, Lewis asked in the comments to talk a little bit about communism. We're not going to do that this week, but we will do it next week when we talk about uh, social movements and the search for justice in Latin America. We'll talk more about uh, the Cuban revolution there. For now, we'll just uh, say that it didn't solve all the issues that were in Cuba. A third way in which uh, Latin American societies are said to be more fluid or less rigid than the United States has to do with uh, how people uh, cross or, or how people actually look at skin color and how that's connected to uh, wealth and social status. So here I wanna turn uh, specifically to Brazil because Brazil is uh, in some ways a, an anthropological favorite counterpoint to the United States where 
uh, anthropologists have documented hundreds of different terms for skin color and race. So that in Brazil, people would actually look at, seriously investigate your skin color and could, you know, group you or, or describe that skin color and that would be your race. And so some anthropologists have claimed that in Brazil, they would, you know, some people might change their race or their skin color over their lifetime based on whether they spent a lot of time out in the sun or were able to get a good job working in an office instead, uh, that they would change their life over their race over their lifetime, or even in some strange cases seasonally, that they would wake up at different seasons and be a different race. So uh, Brazil is kind of a, a counterpoint again to the United States because people don't necessarily get categorized at birth and it really is does have a lot to do with an examination of skin color. Aha, that's what I was just talking about, that you could change your race over your lifetime or even, even from, from summer to winter. And then there's a very famous Brazilian phrase often said with a little finger gesture, which is money whitens. And so uh, the idea is that as you, if you rise up and get more stuff, more economic status, that that also uh, changes, not necessarily literally, but, but you, you then achieve whiteness by having money. And so, uh, Pele, who's perhaps one of the greatest uh, football soccer players of all time. I think somebody said about him once that, uh, that he, was, he was like God on the soccer field if God tried to truly dedicate himself to the game. Um, so Pele was an extremely famous soccer player and, and came from humble origins, but rose to the top of uh, acquired a lot of wealth, and some people would say about Pele, if you ask people, they'd say, well, what race is Pele? And they'd say, well, Pele is white. And you'd be like, what? Like, money whitens. Look at him. There he is. He's made it. So uh, this is kind of, again, another way in which Latin American society sometimes can be more, have more fluidity. Fourth way in which, uh, and it's perhaps related to the third of, of a, a more fluid sense in Latin America is the idea of that you could change your race or your ethnic identity based on kind of where you were and what you were doing. So you might be classify someone as an Indian or an Indio in a certain context if they have a farm, they're speaking an indigenous language, if they have a poncho on and in a rural area. But that very same person could move into a city and put on a tie, start speaking Spanish, become a teacher, and then not, there wouldn't be any biological change, but they'd be classified as mestizo or uh, they somehow have changed their classification, even though there isn't a biological uh, classification change. And this led to the idea in many uh, Latin American countries that, uh, that they felt that the, the indigenous populations, the Indians were simply going to disappear. They were going to biologically, culturally, and socially blend into what this sort of, what was becoming, people said, a majority mestizo society. And so the idea was that, you know, eventually all these indigenous groups were going to mix in and as they became urban and as they became uh, more modernized, that the, the nations, their nations would become these mixed uh, mixed character nations. Now, around 19, the end of the 1980s and early 1990s, that got completely upended. 
And we saw across the Americas, but in a lot of places where it didn't seem like, uh, it seemed like indigenous populations had, had gone away, that instead we see these huge indigenous movements demanding uh, indigenous identity, uh, demanding uh, different, uh, different rights, uh, pushing for bilingual education and teaching indigenous languages in schools. And so this kind of upended a lot of uh, people's ideas in Latin America about the very trajectory of their society. And in some societies, I think Gabe uh, commented a bit on this, like in Bolivia, um, obviously in some ways you could say that there was a demographic, uh, there were a lot of people who identified as indigenous, who spoke an indigenous language. And so we had in, in Bolivia, uh, the rise of Evo Morales, the first uh, indigenous identified president to be elected in Bolivia and really seized upon some of those indigenous symbolisms, which again, people thought were going to disappear. Now, so it seemed perhaps understandable in places like Bolivia and uh, Ecuador to an extent in Peru, but there were other places where uh, people I think really believed that, uh, that the, the indigenous populations had disappeared. Um, but uh, in places like Colombia, they, uh, they actually um, had, a, had a huge sort of indigenous movement revival, changed the constitution uh, to become a recognized as a multicultural uh, country. Uh, Chile uh, was one of those places that, uh, that had some pretty brutal wars of uh, extermination. So it would, it would be sort of unthinkable to people in the 1970s, let's say in Chile, especially 1970s Chile, that there'd be people uh, of Mapuche identity. What are they doing, Lydia? What do you find? Yeah, so again, they, you know, very oppressed for a very long time, but, but sort of getting some recent rights and, and, and what were they doing in your video? Uh, I keep wanting you to say, and they're rapping on YouTube, which would be, you know, much better than the song I made you listen to the other day, which is to say, I mean, it would be unthinkable in Chilean society in the 1970s that there'd be Mapuche people on YouTube. Now, of course, they didn't have YouTube, but the whole idea that they'd have this global reach and be able to participate in a musical scene like rapping with a youth, you know, and be able to articulate themselves in that way and still retain that Mapuche identity would have been like, people would be like, no, that, that's impossible. They're all gonna just, you know, fade into uh, uh, Chilean life or Colombian life. And so what we've seen is these kinds of cultural expressions. This happened uh, in Mexico as well with people are all of a sudden the, the Zapatista movement uh, and all of a sudden people are like, wait a second, you know, they're, they were supposed to be gone. They were supposed to be disappeared. And here they are using all the, the, the most modern means of communication, rapping and doing all the things that, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that we didn't think, didn't think they'd be doing. And so, you know, again, it doesn't, I'm not saying all the problems are solved, but there's been an incredible shift here in terms of uh, the, the rise of indigenous movements. All right, let's talk a little bit about why 
we see ideas in the United States mainly of rigidity in terms of race and, and in Latin America more uh, fluidity. We talked about this uh, a little bit ago, it's simply a demographic issue, that there are 10 times as many, uh, as, as many uh, African descended peoples in Latin America and the Caribbean. So uh, a larger population and that uh, this is also the place of the Aztec and the Inca Empire, and certainly much was destroyed by the Spaniards. Uh, but still, there was a large, a much larger by percentage indigenous population uh, than lived in the United States. And so, just simply with the numbers, demographically, the number of people, you have uh, bigger populations that live in these areas. Some people have, uh, and you know, I don't know, I kind of waver on this because sometimes it becomes this idea that the Spaniards or the French were, were less racist than the English. And I don't know if I wanted to, to go that far, uh, but they certainly sometimes had different uh, ideas about about blood and different ways in which those became part of the legal code. Um, in the second half of class, we'll watch a film that has to do with Haiti and the, the, the hens de couleur, or the, the people of color there, who came under a different code, a different legal code that gave them more rights than they would have had in in some of the English colonies like Jamaica or in the United States. And so it wasn't necessarily that there was a huge cultural difference, but there were sometimes legal differences uh, with how uh, populations were, were treated. And that may in some instances have led to different kinds of, of being able to take advantage of certain situations and, and do things like own plantations and, and, and slaves as well. Uh, we'll talk about gender more on Thursday, but some people have said, well, the, the Spaniards were sending in more young males who were, uh, you know, trying to do, to do the conquering thing and get their land grants. And as we saw in the last film, Pizarro was unmarried at 52. And so he gets a, he gets a, young concubine at, from, uh, from, the, from the, the, uh, the trying to make an indigenous alliance with him. Um, so that would be the case of that they, they didn't necessarily bring their families over on the conquistador missions. And, uh, and the same thing with in French or British colonies that they often would send out their young males to run the plantations. And so instead of you know, and sometimes I think this contrast can be pushed too far, but I mean, if we think about the United States and the idea that they were going to send over these small farming religious people instead of uh, the idea that they were running an economic or a, um, or a conquering enterprise in the, in the new colonies. All right, so that is the, the typical story of both Latin America and the United States. And now we're gonna investigate that a little bit more, a tiny bit, go into it and see, you know, I think that sometimes we wanna also check out the other potential side of this. Is Latin America and the Caribbean really as fluid as it's been portrayed? So Santa Bria brings up a couple of examples. I know Brendan talked about this a little bit in terms of the stains, the stains of, of having impure blood. Um, in the Spanish colonies, people really did want to preserve this idea of having clean blood or pure blood. And it could lead to some very extreme, what we call endogamy, where you would only marry within your own social group at the top. You wouldn't you wouldn't marry outside of that. And so you get these situations where, 
a very small group of people were only marrying each other in this attempt to sort of insulate themselves from the larger population. We talked about in the last class how uh, for, uh, for many Latin American Caribbean countries, they saw the elites saw themselves as the white minority and that the majority was a dangerous uh, black or indigenous population. And so in that sense, they try to seal themselves off and you would and you'd sort of scrutinize people's bloodlines for the stains of maybe having indigenous or black ancestry and you try and root those people out and make sure you don't marry them. So it could, it could be really, really serious in a way that uh, is hard to imagine from our own vantage point. Uh, professor, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so like I asked the question on my comment, I was wondering, would, uh, like people, indigenous people like lie about like, who were they a part of? Because like, they couldn't really tell like the difference with like race and you can't really tell the difference between like bloodline. So would sometimes like people like just lie to like, uh, being like the more powerful, like, uh, uh, race, which I think like was Spanish at the time. Yeah. So I would, yeah. Okay. I guess. I was trying to answer your question in a, in a different way, but now that you pose it that way, I understand more what you're saying. So yeah, it wouldn't be, so I think in your question you asked about the, the reason I didn't understand is you asked about indigenous people. So they wouldn't necessarily yeah, yeah. be, oh. so, so we're talking about the elites, the sort of white identifying elites that were coming from Spain and what they were worried about, right? Was being stained with indigenous or African ancestry. And so would people lie about their ancestry? Uh, do uh, people ever lie about their ancestry, Brendan? Uh, yes. Oh, yes, they do. So yes, they would definitely, people would, you know, if you knew something, you might try to, you know, put away the pictures or, you know, hide the evidence. Um, I don't think this is, this is pretty common in many, 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 many societies our own and all across the world, right? If you're trying to, to hide what you consider to be a, a bad aspect that might not make you marriageable. And so, um, you know, it's interesting because uh, uh, some, some people, you know, so, so some people would scrutinize, there'd be these sayings. I remember in Ecuador, there were these sayings that like, that, that claim that, that the, the indigenous or the, or the black black blood could sort of come out in another generation. So it'd be kind of like you said, you'd, you'd, be, you'd try to lie about it, but then a child would be born and be like, well, where, what happened with this kid? You know, it's like, aha, you've been discovered. So this is a, you know, yeah, the, the, whole, the whole notion that, that, you could, um, that, that you could try to, to clean your bloodline or, or put away the the bad ancestors or raise yourself was always fraught with uh, these kinds of difficulties. True. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Sure. Do people have more of a good like, grasp on their genealogy than like their personal genealogy? Like, was that knowing your personal, I don't know, like three generations back or whatnot? Was that very important thing because I'm always interested like that people don't know like who their great grandparents are nowadays. Right. So that is really key. Okay. So the question is if did people were people interested in their own genealogies uh more, you might say, than or in this context. And I would say, I mean certainly if you are trying to preserve the if you're in the elite category and you're trying to preserve that purity of blood for sure. And so, yeah, you'd have books and, and, you know, you'd have those, those coats of armor and, you know, and then, I mean, you'd try to trace your ancestry to, to, uh, the, you know, the conquistadores, for example, and to keep that, you, you'd want to prove and be able to keep intact the idea that you had European ancestry. And so anything that would, would help to kind of prove that would be, would be helpful to you. Um, you know, I mean, I think, I think among the, the poor and, and, and the indigenous and the African descendant population, they probably, it, it wasn't, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And in fact, you know, um, 
So, you know, I mean, I think, I think this has probably always been true in elite society. I mean, even in this country, you sort of the closer you get to the top, uh, in a lot of ways, people are, are much more concerned with that uh, idea. Um, you know, without getting too much into the into the United States situation, um, because we've in recent years blended a bunch of people into the into the white category, I think people have kind of you know there's been a there's been a recent renaissance in looking for your ancestry, but for a while you were kind of supposed to kind of forget about that, right? You're supposed to ignore if, you know, an Italian and an Irish person got married, you're supposed to just say, you know, it gets too diffuse or something. And so, um, but yeah, certainly I think, I think in, in, in a kind of, a, I mean, we're, we're talking about people who had come from a, a monarchies, right? I mean, they were, you know, the, that was everything. If you could be the child of a king or a queen or a prince, or yeah, I mean, you, know, you had a, a, a an aristocratic system and aristocratic systems are almost always very concerned with, with their bloodlines and all over the world. All right, let's see, where are we? I think we're on the geographic thing. So we're talking about ways in which the Latin America is not quite as fluid as sometimes it's portrayed. And another way is, uh, is how in many Latin American countries, people get associated very severely with their geography so that uh, you know, certain sectors, the rural highlands becomes associated with being a, a certain type of Indian, a kind of a campesino or a, a person who's cultivating the land, a peasant. Uh, and then the coastal areas would become associated with, with blackness. And, uh, and then like the Amazon areas or jungle areas would be associated with, you know, the savage type of Indian. So you'd have the kind of uh, different types of people based on geography, which, be, which would be linked to regional identities um, and, and could be very limiting uh, in, a, in a very rigid way, you might say. Um, a long quote from uh, Mary Weismantle, who did research in, uh, in the Andes in, in Ecuador and Peru. Um, and what she talked about is, you know, that in some ways, although hypothetically people had different categories for mestizo and all those cast up paintings that we talked about, what she said is that in real life, it can be a very vicious binary. So in the same way that we talk about the binary between white and black in the United States, her idea, and people have talked about this for Brazil as well, that you might have, you know, a hundred different skin color terms. But when it comes to sort of practicality, people would discriminate basically between the people who had, had wealth, who were white, and the people who didn't, who were black, and it's you know a simple superior inferior thing, which is again pretty viciously enforced. So some people have argued that that although kind of in an ideal sense, and then going around and talking to people about oh how many skin colors do you recognize, people might be more fluid in Latin America, but in reality in real life there is a this this binary system. And so one of the reasons I'm saying this is sometimes some scholars and some nationalists in Latin America, you might say, have claimed that, say, Brazil is a racial democracy or that Latin American societies are not as racist as the United States. And I, I don't think that that can be sustained. Uh, we, there may be different forms of racism and it may be... Uh, more obviously a form of colorism, so sort of a spectrum, uh, uh, but, just, but we have to be very careful with the idea that they are less racist. And as a kind of add on to that, there are some people in Latin America, especially I think in Brazil, for example, who have kind of longed for a more inclusive category of blackness because they, they want it to be 
something that they could organize uh, resistance around. That is to say, it's very difficult to gather people into one category and say, hey, a kind of civil rights type movement, uh, which in the United States was linked to ideas of being black, it's hard to, to mobilize people around the ideas of being black if nobody agrees that they are black or should identify with that category. So there are some people who have said that, you know, it actually can make it more difficult to organize people uh, because, of, because of these weird, uh, or that was a strange word, because of these different ideas about who's grouped to whom. Nevertheless, I think that uh, Latin American countries and Latin American intellectuals uh, gave us some different ideas at a time when in the United States and in Europe, ideas of eugenics, of breeding out bad traits of so-called scientific racism were around. Uh, Latin American countries uh, often took a different or, or some of them took, some sectors took a different direction. So there was a movement called indigenismo or indigenism. Um, these were movements among the intellectuals, mostly uh, in Peru and in Mexico from, uh, from about the 1930s. And basically what they did was to, uh, to try and, and, and recuperate an idealized version of indigenous identity and say, well, this is what we should base our nation on. Um, now these were, at, for the most part, these were themselves elites and they, but it was a different kind of idea about what national identity should be based upon. As we talked about a little bit in the last class, um, In many or several Latin American countries, they saw uh, the mixing not necessarily as, as leading to whiteness, uh, but as giving people a hybrid vigor or being crossbred. And so that that would result in being a better national citizen and, and a, better, a better person. And so uh, again, at a time when people were were uh, claiming uh, that, you know, that the inferiority of different races uh, and, and ha promoting laws to uh, prevent people from mixing with each other. Um, this was a, a sort of promotion of mixture, uh, which uh, is not, is something we should, we should at least think about uh, in terms of is would that be a better way to to think about things? Uh, Latin Americans also have traditionally, when they see what goes on in the United States, have helped us to question or challenge the idea that people are divided into only two categories: that of black and white. So we've looked at you know is is Latin America as fluid as it's been portrayed? Uh, I'd also like to look at, is the U.S. as rigid as it's being, as it's often been portrayed? And just to sort of start off with a kind of historical, uh, a historical fact. Um, interestingly, a lot of people don't necessarily uh, know this, but before the 1880s, the United States actually did have a mulatto category so we did have a mixed race category, which was on the census. Uh, it was erased from the census. Um, it's still kind of, uh, there, there are in, 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 uh, there are some slangs and people who preserve that category. It's, it is not an official category, but it once was. And so um, many of the laws that we have, the segregation laws, the one drop rules, the, the, the laws to limit uh, African descendant peoples from voting and from owning property and where they could live, a lot of that happened 
after the Civil War from during uh, uh, that 1880s period through the 1930s. Uh, interestingly, that's also when a lot of Confederate monuments went up. They weren't, they didn't come up immediately after the Civil War. They came up during this period. And you can probably see where, why that happens. And they get put up in a lot of strange places like Indiana and uh, different places that were not even part of the South. And a lot of that had to do with, this is a time of increasing US rigidity about you know, where you belonged as a race. So I think that's just an important thing to notice about our own uh, colonial and post-colonial trajectory. Uh, this is also the time when, uh, when scientific racism reaches its, its, its high point in the United States is uh, right before the 1930s. And in fact, uh, German, uh, how to call them, German scientists at the time before uh, the, with the rise of the Nazis, some of them said they were only drawing on the best science of the US, of the United States and putting it into practice, frighteningly. The other thing that happens in the United States, which is that uh, we talked about this a bit in the last class, is that uh, with the immigrants from places in Europe, which were once kind of questionable, uh, the United States once, being white in the United States once meant being a wasp or a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And so people who were Irish or who were Italian were not really considered to be part of the majority white category. And so the way that we in the United States continued as a white majority society is by expanding that white category out uh, larger than it was before. And so this, this led to this, the, uh, the, the continuance of the white black divide as well as the idea that the United States is a majority white society. Now, to turn us back to our original questions about race, um, some people say that the United States is now becoming more fluid or less rigid than we once were in terms of our racial categories. And in part, this might be because people from uh, Latin American and Caribbean countries come into the United States and are like, wait, what? What are you guys talking about? What's, you know, we're, we don't, we're not fitting into your, into your black white categories uh, or uh, people from Asia, people from India uh, have, uh, have questioned our ideas about race. But then on the other hand, um, it might be also that, that the Latinos themselves or the Latin immigrants uh, are starting to identify as either white or black. Uh, in the last, in the 2000, I think it was the 2010 census, uh, over half, over 50% of the people who checked off Hispanic on the ethnicity question also checked off white in the race question. So it's sometimes difficult to say when people talk about, well, you know, the Latino voting trends or Hispanic voting trends, it would be more interesting to me to think about, well, if a, if a Latino says they're Hispanic and white, maybe that's what we should more consider them to be. So I want to take, uh, I think Lydia, you asked about this census. I actually got the, the, got the questions from the 2020 census, which is basically the same as it's been for since the year 2000. When the census decided that we needed to have two questions but you have everybody, everybody in the country has to answer question eight and question nine. And so uh, the United States, at least officially in the official census has decided that Hispanic isn't a race, that it's something else. 
So we ask this, we so you can say no, of course, not of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin. And then we make you decide uh, what kind of Hispanic or Latino. So I, I guess it's probably not a big surprise that we that you can then see the three largest categories of Hispanic descended peoples in the United States. You have uh, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, and Cubans. And in general, Mexicans are, are often in the Southwest, Puerto Ricans often in uh, New York City and, uh, and in Florida, Cubans a lot in Florida. And then we have a whole bunch of, uh, you know, we say you can print an other, uh, other Hispanic categories. Interestingly, we include Spaniard there, which is, uh, I'm not sure what the Spaniards would say about that. But as we've talked about uh, this, we, I don't know what people from Brazil would do with that one. Uh, you know, it's kind of a, it's a, it's an interesting way in which we've decided that we really need to keep track of some people, but we can't figure out who they are and why we're keeping track of them. So this is, uh, this is one of the questions that is on the census. And then everybody, regardless of what you answer to that, you also have to uh, answer the race question as well. And here uh, in my anthropology classes, I go into this in, in more detail just to show how weird and confusing it is to have all these Asian boxes as if Vietnamese, Korean, and Japanese were all separate races uh, is pretty strange. And then, I mean, up here you can see uh, that, and, th and this is a little bit different for the 2020 census. I don't remember having to do this in, in the last years. So if you check off the white box, then you have to print, for example, here's our examples, German, Irish, ah, <laughs> boy, they became white. Okay, English, Italian, also they became white. And then what are they? Oh, Lebanese and Egyptian. Interestingly, I, I actually did census follow-up, uh, it was 20 years ago in the year 2000, and I went to somebody's house and I knocked on her door and I had to ask these questions. And I said, what race are you? And she said, well, they tell me I'm white, but I don't believe them. And I said, well, what do you want me to put? And she actually asked to check off some other race and write in Egyptian. So, uh, you know, I don't want to get too far into this, but the white category in the United States is takes in an enormous geographical range. And there are people that are in places that, uh, that perhaps don't even think of themselves as white who are nevertheless, at least in the US census, uh, classified as white. And then you get to, uh, then you have a black or African-American box. Anyway, for our purposes, What's interesting here is if whatever you clicked, I mean, whatever you checked off back here on this question, so let's say you checked off a uh, Mexican or Puerto Rican, you don't get to write that in as a race. I mean, you could, you could say other race and some people have done that. They've written in some other race and then they'll put Mexican, but uh, others will either check off white or in some cases in which they're, uh, they consider themselves to be more of African ancestry, they check off black, um, you know, it, or, or multiple, uh, multiple check boxes. So uh, it's one of those things that we will, we will never solve. It's, it's still important to gather this information because so much of our lives are still structured around the category of race. So I don't wanna say we should stop doing this, but at the same time, we do need to recognize how, how brutally socially constructed this is, and it isn't a reflection of some sort of biological reality out there, and is a more of a reflection of our own social system and our own wrestling with uh, these categories often to place people into the, the binary of inferior and superior.
I this confuses me. It is really weird, and I like I sometimes say, I don't think that even the most, uh, I don't know, the most Japanese nationalists would consider the Japanese to be a separate race to have their own box. I mean, you know, it, it would seem like it would make more sense to have. The fourth thing, if you're going to have the the Asian categories, is the fourth to say Asian, and then print your origin yeah. and have all those as examples. Maybe they'll do that next time. I don't know why this is I, my idea as to why this is the way it is, is because both of the or all of these categories confuse <laughs> Americans. And so we're like, oh shit, what do we do with these, these folks? Okay, let's make a question for them and break them into all these things. And then we're like, what do we do with these folks? And we also don't know what to do. I think the reason, uh, you know, the Japanese, the Chinese get their own boxes are because we recognize that there are some very powerful countries and like Japan has is the third largest or was once the second largest GDP in the world. And so we're like, oh, that's big, man. We'll give you, whereas we think about, they were like, ah, oh, you know, they're, they're barely even countries. And so, I mean, a lot of it, I think, does have to do with the establishment, as we talked about in the last class of nations and, and, and the idea of, of how much power you have in the world. And so if you're powerful enough, you get a race box. And if we don't think of you as that powerful, you have to stick with a with a little uh, box, and then you have to do race two. I mean, at least this does recognize that you know. I mean that that, that being Cuban uh, can can be everything from extremely light skinned to extremely uh, dark skinned, but it's a it's a weird way to do it.